Hello, Luhan. Hello, Angel. How are you doing? Very good. Welcome, Parallel Perception community. We are on our second video. And let's review what we did a little bit last time. When we ended, we talked about inner silence. And so we're going to go right back into the inner silence as the not doing that shamanic state where Luhan admonishes us to focus on nothing, but be aware of everything. You want to get us started with that one? Focus on nothing, be aware of everything. Yeah, I think we've gone over this, this subject uh, quite extensively, but it's, um, it's difficult for people to understand that there's a, an immovable stillness inside of you. And that immovable stillness is surrounding us completely. You take away every ounce of matter, then you will be confronted by the, an immovable stillness, something which upholds it, everything. So, so when something runs through that, then there's a manifestation. You know, and that manifestation in terms of our own feelings is when, when something runs through the manifestation of our emptiness, there's, there's a reflection of whatever uh, collides with it. And then, then there's a creation. So it's, it's exactly the same with the universe, exactly the same with us. The origins of our emptiness have been uh, kind of obscure because we're, we're, we're coveted by thoughts, coveted by uh, feelings which really shouldn't be there. And, um, if we if we if we take away thought, we take away the the feelings which uh, are holding us and binding us through habitual uh, narratives, through through habitual damage and reflection on that damage, and creating something to protect ourselves with. We take all that away, then we we will actually read the environment with exactly the same process, but not the weaponized or the or the engineered process that we've got, we got going, so that um, the world uh, will speak to us and we'll. We will uh, communicate uh, by virtue of that um, uh, very, very beautiful communication. So we write on we write on that and the reality of that, and it's um it's a very same subject that we were talking about just before we got on. So I'm yes. going to I'm going to I'm going to use reference to something which is which is not revealing anything about you and your your conversation with me and vice versa. Is it um is it is it when you when you come in contact, you you begin to um, from an evolutionary perspective, you, as the contact hits you, goes inside of you, it then reformulates inside of you and then manifests an, an alternate feeling in comparison to what you're in contact with. So what we've got to do is, is we have a, the, the contact feeling or the, or the source of the contact, which is maybe another person, and uh, they, they enter you slowly, and as they enter you, you begin to you begin to arise like this, and it goes in and then comes out. As it comes out, it it, um, it reveals itself as sort of feelings that we need to sort out, feelings that we can't really understand because they because the 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 um, the source of the contact is not there, but the residue of the contact contact <clears throat> is living inside of us. And then as it as it rapidly expands, and we're examining feelings. That are that are not really in accordance to what we really believe with the, with experience comes out. So then there's a there's a certain more sort of um, discord inside. Uh, people believe that they don't really have contact with such a deep uh, resonating field within inside themselves, but yes, they do. But um, <clears throat> the reason why we can't work it out is that um, we're so socially engineered that we we connect to the our original emotion, we connect to our weaknesses, uh, connect to our deficiencies instead of really seeing. The weakness and, and the deficiencies which are which are manifesting inside of you which is just a uh, a mirror image of the other person's um field uh, colliding and then reor then you're re becoming reorganized as you become reorganized then there's a disorientation and um and when you realize that you're that you're going off your path and you then you virtually got to communicate um with another human being you've got to communicate with another human being in the vein of what arises inside of you and say what is this um let's navigate uh, the feeling that i've got and why is it there and try to get to the to the source point of it and then you start to navigate the whole circumstance in terms of everything that uh, that arises because of your inquiry it's a very very complex affair and living is a very complex affair so silence is like this it goes into you 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 may um you may be uh, resolve to be very, very empty, very, very content, and then your eyes will shoot to to somewhere to look into your environment, and then you'll discover that there's something in your environment that's drawing you to it. This is exactly the same with human behavior. The laws never change. They're always so consistent. 
So, we say, so no matter what, if you walk into a into a, a desert region or a rainforest, your your body will automatically go to to an area of you, and you don't know why, but you're being led there. And it's the same with the when something comes into your body, your your internal eye will go to somewhere where you didn't really, I don't really understand why you're being led there, but you have to examine it and fully fully travel uh, what has occurred inside of you. Uh, to discover what the real essence of the of your external and environment, external and internal environment, are revealing to you. So silence is very, very valuable. But um, but our silence has been over overridden uh, in a certain in many many different degrees by by disappointments, by wants needs, by wanting to be fulfilled and everything like this because our society has forgotten to be. Um, to cradle everybody in in the in non expectation, but uh, but the value of what um, what we really need to uh, travel upon to succeed as a humanity. Okay. Uh, have I gone off into a tangent? <laughs> no, no, we're good. We're good. This was kind of a review of last time because we had spoken on it uh, again, just to kind of get people back in gear, and then we'll yeah. pick up the chapter that is being, knowing, and doing. So, in the beginning of this chapter, you ask us to write the word doing and yeah. use the arrow for liquid confirmation and the down arrow for self-importance or validation. Can you mm. explain that a little bit? Well, you validate through, through lock feelings and liquid conf confirmation is basically you liquidly see something you don't ask to, um, to be valid. You don't validate yourself, but you watch it very, very carefully. You know what you see, but you don't, you don't put a framework around it, which is, um, which is solid. You allow it to you allow it to not to be not to be locked in by by imprisoning that idea with the with the formulation of what you really believe you know with uh, self-importance you lock yourself into the whole principle of i know i'm going to judge and you miss something very very subtle because you because you've got a locked framework that um that you've got to defend you've got to you've got to speak on the behalf of of this of this feeling of um need needing to communicate in this way but but actually you're you're locking your circumstances by by being so certain about something which is which should have a, a, a grain of a grain of uh, sand in there which uh, reveals that um, okay i do believe that i know what i know this is liquid confirmation i do believe i know what i know but i'm going to give it an opportunity to shift and change so my so so my perception uh doesn't interfere with it uh too much and then you then you allow the ebbs and flows to to guide you into into areas of possibilities with the other with the other with the self-importance you lock yourself into a predetermined idea that you're going to defend you're going to fight for and you may miss the point so this is this is why we've got we've got to understand we see what we see through liquid confirmation liquid confirmation principle is to is to outline that uh with the with the fixed uh, parameters around self-importance about um, being absolutely correct and absolutely right um, is too solid. So, the, so giving the, the, the value between the, the two in terms of yes, you do know, but be liquid enough not to attach yourself to it, and the other one is yes, I do know, and, and I'm, I'm going to be rigidly held and convince everybody about that. We get locked into that field of perception. Okay, yeah. you just said something that at, at first I was trying to figure out why you use the phrase liquid confirmation but you just said something that gave me a picture of water rolling off a duck's back when you said yes. be liquid enough to release and then it made sense so yeah <laughs> and, it, and no matter how much it says quack it still goes off the back <laughs> exactly <laughs> so i was like okay now i can see liquid confirmation you receive that wisdom for that moment and then well like imagine this Imagine you've got a really big boulder and it's, and it's in a stream and the stream is is flowing very, very strong because of the because it's a rainy season. The water um, sees the rock, runs around it and leaves. Mm -hmm. You know, it has the experience of it and then leaves. And I then like the that. water, even though the water has left from that particular point, you can see the water moving, the water really hasn't moved. It's still surrounding it. No matter what, even if, even if, I, if I float, a small little um, object on the water it'll be carried down and you say well okay now the realization is all the way down there it's all the way down there but the rock is still in the water and the water is still not as the water is not disconnected just because the floating object is one mile down there one mile back the water is still connected so there's a connective field so like that, so when so when your perception leaves the the lock field of perception in terms of a rock you're going around the rock the rock is slowly being transformed and and changing 
by virtue of the pressure of, of this um, of this going around it. But the, but as it as it moves away from it, the, you never lose contact from that. But your but your environment, your the essence of the vibration in the new environment affects the viewpoint in comparison to where you were in comparison to where you are yet the river flows continually so that from the from the from the outlet to the to the source you've always got a connection so that's liquid confirmation even though you see something you're surrounding it you're you're completely aware of it and it's just like um oh my parents what if, what did they do no if you really look at this um your parents your parents actually did something to to give you a reference point of where you shouldn't be and you're like that river you flow away from them and as you flow away from you blame them for what they did in your past as you flow away from them you should say okay they were just they were just limited mis and they misunderstood their life path why why from this distance do i go back to that point where the where where the flow of water is is like an eddy around what they did let them go and and go to your future um destination and and you still look back but you, you don't look back with shame or blame because because they did the best they could within within the parameters of what they were uh, the tools they were given and right. um yeah there's no need to hold them there because they're going to change anyway and if you hold them in resentment say you're not going to change and be a nice person and be nice to them you weren't to me i'm going to hold you in that fixed position Ooh, so that's so that is so dangerous yes but that was we just got to let it go and be changed yeah. by that um, you spoke a lot about um, when we talk about entering into the loops in the mind and mm -hmm. how judging a circumstance or situation um, prevents us from having uh, true knowledge. You said that this is a controlled folly. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, you you see something is is designed to capture you, so you don't want to be captured. Don't want to be captured uh, within the within the eddy revealed. Because when you when you're captured by the eddy revealed, um, you're subject to one type of truth, but there's another type of truth out there. It's just like politics. Politician oh. will spin something one way. You'll say, "Oh, yes, that's true," and they they set you in such a in such a way that you that the biases believe me, you can't believe them, and then there's then there's conflict between between two people who want to lead the country. So you, so how do, how can this really work? You you should okay. The, there are two leaders who want to lead the country. They they tell the truth. They don't they don't uh, uh, try to destroy each other. They try to do the best for the country and the people. Instead of leading people down the path of destroy the idea of him, destroy the idea of that person. No, just see see who's who's best for the job and who's released enough to actually do what needs to be done. So. Uh, yeah, <laughs> if that were the priority, but sometimes it's just self-centered power at grab, and that's yep. why we're not getting to the main thing. <laughs> the main thing, exactly, exactly. So the doings, other doings you were saying are like um, that we constantly get stuck in our habituated narratives, mind loops, the circular dogmas. Um, yep. Those are some of the follies that you had talked about. Um, yep. Then you made a mention about how we have formulated the idea of God. Um, that that was the formulated idea of ma that man has of God is to control its underlings and ongoing de-education and mm -hmm. it cultivates a diminished concept of self. I like yes. that. Okay. Yes. Now, what if I would say, what if I said to you that God is right here inside of you and the gesture of your growth towards something quite tremendous is set here? And then you, you don't look anywhere else for 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 authority other than the authority of your own heart. And then this is the best way to to diminish the idea that there's something there's a power outside of you. When the, when the power is inside of us, if we divide a million people, say there's a power outside, you give uh, specific rules and regulations for that power outside to control a human being. You lose your capacity to actually define who you really are without the fear and mechanisms of something external, which has got to do with people trying to control people. Actually, religion is trying to call, control people. So it's actually examining what's inside of ourselves in terms of in terms of how we really need to proceed in, to, in terms of the purity of that of that um, either uh, limitless or limited um, uh, perception. Uh, to be cultivated because even if you're limited you're limitless you're still limited and if we go back to maybe even uh, the power of emptiness is that is that um, the the whole concept of someone only taking 200 steps and someone taking 10,000 steps you're reduced to that 200 steps whether you like it or not 
So because they'll see you and dress you within those 200 steps because they don't have any other value other than 200 steps. Now, if someone's really smart, they'll say, well, we're within your 200 steps. I've taken 10,000 steps and, um, you know, I've got control issues. And this is, the, this is a, you know, the religious authority all over the world in every single phase, ways and means to, to say, well, if you do this, um, if you do it this way, the way we're going to tell you, because we've got more experience in you, we've got the, the key to, to, the, to the threshold that you need to cross, you need to trust us. Um, it's very, very difficult for somebody to go beyond that because they, they externalize something which is not empowered inside of themselves. I don't, did it make sense there? Yes, it makes sense that they're empowering something that is outside of themselves, contrary to what Yeshua kept saying, because he kept saying the kingdom of heaven is within you. The kingdom of heaven is within you. But people have been programmed to look outside themselves and create that image of God. So, yeah, yeah. that makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things you oh, talked about. Also, also oh, too, I would say, I would say, I'm sorry, Angel. If, if I say, well, Luhan, what's, what's the foundation of your, of the premise of all your perception? The, the longer I live, the older I become, uh, the, the depth of affection and love is going through all my long channels or my limbs, my limbs like this. And this, this feeling is, is becoming, um, is encroaching upon every single cell, every, every um, part of my physiology is filled with this. You know, so, so if you if you understand that you have to increase the beauty of your heart uh, to extend to the full parameters of every single inch of your body then you you become you become this and it's very very difficult to explain and um i've always wanted to to uh give give a um give value to a to heart consciousness as heart consciousness first starts here and then it gets buried and then all of a sudden it pops out and you, you're joyous and then it goes back in until eventually it just spreads until you become that that particular feeling all over your whole body and this is a very very beautiful feeling and that's what we need to experience this and and some of the what is it the knowledge that helps us experience that or what would help us experience that what one um, thing we but, but by being being knowing and, and not doing the no. prospect of something that uh, that will devalue this particular feeling inside of your body. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, you also made a comment that um, it was interesting, and if I may paraphrase, you said that the most subversive form of slavery is basically the social particulars that have us working from paycheck to paycheck, and that mm -hmm. that disenfranchises us. Disenfranchises us. <laughs> this disenfranchises us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fried chicken. You know, and you said that to overcome it, we've got to over, overcome it by realizing our own sovereignty. So can you speak on that? Yeah. Yes. You know, it's um, to, to put to put um, uh, people in, into servitude in terms of earning it. it um, they, they, the value of uh, what they're doing is put into the into the hard labor of their life. And we they, they, they just miss the plot. So the, the the ways and means that that everything structured is to is to have you so involved in your survival mechanisms you don't realize that uh, that survival of your spirit has been diminished but the survival of your body is is paramount and uh, more important. Where we're actually they're both equally as important as each other. Yes, well, we definitely you... don't give as much time to our spirit as we do to sustaining the body. We just don't. <laughs> Yeah, but but also there's a contradiction in that. Is that whichever position you're in, the values of your of your own um, internal realizations, uh, you truly have to live by that. Even if you're in a circumstance that can't see you, there's still a lot of enormous amount of growth that can come by not being seen, and not being recognized for who you really are. And I, I do this all the, all the time. With, without my students being around, nobody knows who I am. Nobody knows uh, how much I'm perceiving in terms of what, what's coming at me. And you stay humble, and you you know this is the value of your growth. But people people feel resent resentment, a lot of resentment for being in the position they are. But what what I'd say is is, is um, take uh, take uh, take heed to the position you're in, because there's an enormous amount of growth that can be. They can be yielded uh, to a person by just uh, realizing that they can't change something, but do the best they can within the circumstance they can't change until it alters. Yeah. Okay. Well, then when we get faced with something, you, this this next part that you used, I, I love the analogy. You said that there are three steps into the temple, you know, and three steps that we must take, but stop mm -hmm. shy of that fourth step. <laughs> That's where we lose things to reverse our eyes 
reverse our ear and anchor ourselves in an inner silence. Um, and we talk about those techniques, but I wanted to talk about what happens after that, but please. Well, if you, if you, if you go too far, you can't go too far. If you, if you know that you, you're there three, three steps inwardly, if you add something that's not pertinent, it will, there will be an endless, an endless drop. Like if you go, especially if you go to Bali or any temple, there's always three steps. There's never the fourth step. The fourth step represents ruin. So you, so you've got to know how far you, how far you can go without um, destroying the prospect of what you're, what you're evolving towards. Uh, how do I make this clear? <laughs> I don't know how to make it clear. It's, it's basically if you go too far, when you, when you never reach beyond a certain point that you know you can't reach beyond. It's like, um, it's like grabbing, grabbing, grabbing something and you're on the edge of a cliff. You grab just a little bit too, too far. You go a little bit too far, you fall. And then there's, a, then, then there's an endless result to that. So it's, um, so to know to hold yourself back to a certain degree and not, not, uh, not, um, not try to venture into the realms which you can't venture into because the door's not really opened yet, you know, so and also you not, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Also, uh, sorry. Not to you, not to lose the value of your own, of your own sense of self as well, because your sense of self is very, very important to, to, to hold into balance, to make sure it's not corrupted in any way. And that's like the fourth step when you'll be going back to your mind after you found a reservoir of wisdom and then you go back to your mind and then cultivate that wisdom through a, through a psychological process. Then it's a, then it becomes an end, endless loop and an entrapment that, that intelligence, um, devices to keep uh, keep somebody else in a loop of um, uh, servitude because they don't quite understand how to get there for themselves when you were saying yeah. how could you explain it what picture came to mind was like a black hole and that fourth step being the event horizon that you step over into <laughs> and then you're gone then but you're gone. um you said that that fourth step is basically our internal dialogue and you used mm -hmm. it the analogy of being a trap or like the venom of the black widow spider um yeah. and so would you yeah, you you've you've already always got to be on guard is a is it uh, the perception of the of the um of the um the serpent is basically it's it's divisive it's separated it uh, it's sneaky it's uh it will it will slither into into areas um um so you, it can't be held fixed it's always moving um, and if it's always moving and if it gets caught, then it may turn into a white tiger. White tiger um, formulates anger to, to put somebody on their back foot. And when they're on their back foot, they can't realize because they're dealing with the anger, which is the underlying anger. Un underneath the anger is the deception of the serpent. And then you then if the anger doesn't work, then it's then the black widow or the perception of the black widow comes in. The black widow will destroy the other person and themselves and every single thing in the environment not to be seen. So we, we've got to be very, very careful not to use any divisive means to hold fix uh, a situation which needs to be fluid and which uh, uh, the, the, the teacher or the, and the student need to travel upon unencumbered without, without any, um, the teacher using the leverage of intelligence in terms of turning into an intellectual affair and then the sounding board of that intellectual affair becomes a prospect of just communicating with words instead of communicating with true feelings. You talked, you talked about that, um, that conversation uh, so that we're not in the intellect. You said, don't talk to anyone about the realizations we get, not even yourself, to be self-congratulatory, not to yeah. enter. Yeah, because that, that, okay. starts, that, that's a, that starts the cycle of um, wanting to be recognized. You know, if you don't want to be recognized, then you, then you may, be, you may have, a, have a resource because you because you're sustain yourself with not wanting to be seen. Yet if you don't want to be seen, then something will be shown. To the person who doesn't want to be seen because and they're acting without motive acting without motive yeah okay. and uh, then the influx of the environment gives gives uh, value to the words yeah and the purity of those particular words okay now one of the things you talked about was how our omnipresence was diminished by the original sin and not the the one that some christianity or religion talks about the original sin in the garden of eden but could you elaborate more on what you mean by original sin? Original sin is, is to be exactly where you're not meant to be. 
so you you endeavor to be exactly where you're meant to be uh like in um in who am i it's like um um be in the right place at the right time be in the right place at the wrong time be in the wrong place at the wrong time be in the right place at the right time and all this take taking this and and putting it into different positions is that you could be in the right place but the wrong thing is coming at you but that's the right place to be to understand that mm. you know so this is a very complex affair in terms of is where am i meant to be what am i meant to do and how am i how you how you expect it to adjust without the expectation of adjustment you know so so somebody may give you a signal you're in the wrong place but you're actually seeing something perfect <laughs> okay i'm digesting that sorry for the pause <laughs> yeah no, no that's okay that's i was okay. just processing that i'm like wow okay <laughs> well, being, being in the right place at the right time is also also you have to be very very careful to be in the right place at the right time because because then the syndrome is i'm in the right place at the right time even though there's something wrong happening you know this this has got to be navigated so any original sin is basically missing the mark. You are not where you're supposed to be. You're not saying what you're supposed to say. You're not being the person that you need to be. You're not in your full integrity. That's going to yeah, be. You're not, yeah, you're not. You're not in the right in the right place. So, so uh, sin is to be in the not in your in your true nature, to be in the altered nature to uh, to accommodate maybe you, um, an egotistical view of yourself or to accommodate somebody. Um, and you don't you don't reveal the truth of what you're realizing, then then you're uh, what would you say you're enabling somebody to be something they shouldn't be, and then that enabling uh, corrupts the person who allows that person to do it because they're doing it themselves by enabling them. So in a lot of cases, a, t a teacher can do a lot of damage by by catering to somebody instead of instead of speaking to truth. In you know catering catering to someone puts you in the wrong the wrong place instead of challenging what's in front of you. And that's catering and enabling something that uh, that that will become so so strong that when it comes back around, the teacher's going to have 10, 10 times more more power to put into it to resolve it. And if you do it over and over and over again, you've created a a, a very subtle monster. Yeah, <laughs> you, I, want, I wanted to get clarification on this. You talk, you talked about that omens are an invitation for us to return to our true nature. Everyone's looking for signs and wonders, but this omen. Is that the pure information that's given, or is that just the tidbit that we might take out of context? What do you mean by okay, those omens? An omen, an omen is really basically you you identify something, um, and then you speak to what you identify. Okay. That's that's it's an indication. It's basically speaking to you, and you and you re, you reveal it to the to the person at in um, at hand. But it, but in the wilderness. Omens are, are very, very different because they they hit you on a on a level of non comprehension because your body has to move um, harmonious with within that environment, and then then through through um, habitual repetition, you discover something there. So to to give a to give an explanation to this is a very um, delicate affair because because somebody may be looking for an omen. And that omen is looking for self-confirmation and self-empowerment through that confirmation, through the fantasy of I found an omen, um, like a crow came down and landed on the fence. You know, it's like, mm -mm. no, no, no. It's it's basically uh, be be in your environment until you discover something you need to speak to. That's the true omen. That's the true work. You know, and when you're in an, when you're in the wilderness, is is that your your body takes over, and then then the this uh, coexisting ebbs and flow of the environment speak to your body and then you act appropriately and watch what you're doing but don't decide what you're doing because you're watching what you're doing and that's the true omen so so if you expect an omen you're not doing that i'm terrible i'm, I'm disassembling shamanism <laughs> well uh yes and and a lot of other things law of attraction a lot of things it's <laughs> mm. good we love you anyway <laughs> no. yeah so once you get this element <laughs> observed so we, we get this wisdom, we get this understanding, um, and we've not judged, so we've become the being. And you said, that's an item of power. And you said, then it's no longer any of your business. You shouldn't worry about it. And I was like, well, wait, what, what just happened? <laughs> What's yeah, it's, not, it's, yeah. it's none of your business. Once once you realize something and you 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 see it for what it is, then you let it, you let it go. Because holding on to it is holding on to the fixation of how great you are because you notice something. You know, it's like, um, 
when I was explaining oh. in the in the other in the other view, interview by seeing through a wall, is that if I would have um, continually said to myself, "Well, I got a panel. I look through the wall," I didn't notice that I was being viewed. Yeah, and when I noticed I was being viewed, I, I didn't want to go down the track of of the power which was which was made laid right in front of me. This is yours. Um, continue with this, you'll become much more powerful. I said, no, I prefer to um, to locate what is looking at me and why is it looking at me and, and how come I notice that? It, yeah, I'm, I'm answering the question in a very obscure way. That's okay. Because it's, none of, it's, not, it's none of my business. The power is none of my business anymore because I realize there's something obscure um, testing me through the power that's being that that could have been obtained or is obtained, but I but I don't want anything to do with it. So, so then it's none of my business anymore. So I just let it go, because if I hold on to that and try and fixate on that, it's like um, I did uh, these these movements for for many many years and went like this. And the plow, um, people can look it up on YouTube. There's a there's a point uh, 26 seconds into the video, the the frangipani moves. And the French penny moves when I go very, very gentle like this, goes like that. And um, the guy who was filming it said, did you notice that every time you did that particular movement, the, the, the French penny moved? And I said, well, uh, no, I didn't know I could do it. And yes, I can see that I, that I did do it. And he said, we're well, going to pursue it. And I said, no, I can already do it. And I don't want to pursue something I didn't know I could do when I knew I could do it because I know that's a trap. Because, uh, because by virtue of doing this, what else is going to come from this if I don't pursue um, the the lower nature of this particular event so then so then you you've got um you gotta look at um how powers can trap you in the in the you know kinetic kinetic to to, to generate uh, telekinetics everyone thinks that's fantastic but it's it's the lower rung of of telekinetics is the movement of physical objects what happens if you don't uh, pursue that what how does can telekinetics evolve that's the that's the next question. So people want the telekinetic uh, ability to move something in their environment, but what if they don't pursue that? If they can already, if it's already manifested in their body by doing love empire, then the telekinetics becomes something else. So so if I'm if I'm sitting and then you move, and the flower moves inside of you, I'm aware of that flower moving. That's the next level next level of telekinetics. And but it's very, very obscure because you have to empty yourself and you have to be very, very diligent about what's moving inside of you, what's moved inside of the other person because of contact. Mm. Good. I was going to say the French Japani, for those who didn't know, I, I think if I remember correctly, it's like a five petaled flower that that's what you're yes. talking about spinning. So the people knew yeah. what that was because I had to look yeah. it up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so when we're talking about um, our realization and definitely not to analyze it. So that's when it's no longer any of our business. Don't try and figure out the what's, the why's, the wherefores. Just let it go. That's the release piece. Yeah. Um, you also talk, and we keep, and all of these concepts you even uh, say in the book are multi layered for um, different layers of understanding um, that we can store our silence in a silence reservoir. And I like the idea of storing silence because, you know, it's like as much as I try to be diligent with my meditation practice, there are some days I'm not so much as others to know that when I was able to meditate and be in silence, that that's stored and usable. Is that correct understanding? Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, there's there's, there's enormous, uh, enormous amounts of silence that can come from movement. There's enormous amount of silence that comes from realization. So, uh, when you, if if you go into meditation and you look for stillness, but um, but the movement within you, um, you don't qualify that as as stillness itself as well, because you you navigate the movements as stillness, because the stillness is the navigation of that movement. So we're we're all we're all in contact with the with the stillness behind movement. So it's a, so if, if, if I do a, a movement like this and I stretch my fascia and then release, there's a, there's an automatic pull of those bows down into my body. So I watch those those particular movements uh, and following those particular, like this, this is an initiation of it and the result is something to sink down inside of the body. So, so you may initiate meditation um, and uh, the initiate of meditation will, will travel through certain areas, um, but you have to practice uh, moving the fascia um, before before stillness really becomes uh, totally a viable option. 
and it may not be a viable option for a lot of people to go into into still meditation you can you can actually achieve um quite a quite a lot by 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 moving through the the secret lines of your body which don't contain mind so you can you completely empty just like that in terms of the movement facilitating your silence for you so but when you do when you do go to sit into 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 stillness uh, it takes 25 mil, minutes this is what i want you to practice sit still for 25 minutes before you even start so if i'm sitting here like this and i'm waiting then I'm waiting for something to cover me and to encroach upon me and, and make me very, very still. Um, nothing can move in that 25 minutes. You just watch your body and stay as still as possible without anything, anything. then you're sealed. Once you're sealed, then the, then the, then the possibility of going to medita meditation after you're sealed is possible. So the, the first technique of meditation is sit still and and sit still to such a degree that that there is no movement within the sitting still until you you'll feel it come upon you there'll, there'll be a ceiling or a hermetic seal which comes upon you and that stillness then then you travel into into meditation after you've commanded your body to be still without any form of movement or thought because we don't want to have thought during that time as well i'm assuming yeah well you can watch you you watch your body you you watch, watch your that still yeah you watch your breath but you watch the stillness coming upon you okay. it's exactly the same what you do when you go when you go to sleep you're watching the stillness come upon you and there may be maybe instances where thoughts and visual visualizations come in to to interrupt that stillness but you you know your body needs to rest so your body goes into stillness and then it may go into other areas yeah while you're doing that and try and tempt you out but you want to go in because you're exhausted you need to sleep I like that you said movement can also bring silence to the body. I didn't think of that as a possibility. I knew that the the movement piece was necessary for the fullness of realization, but I didn't fathom that movement could help contribute to silence or not moving, I guess. Yeah, well, not moving can it gives you a it gives you a feeling of being hermetically sealed. Um so not moving is is very very valuable. So if you sit still enough, or even if you move and you and you watch the um, the reflective reflective re reflective bows with inside of you go to their source. Once that once you watch you, you there's no thoughts because you go into those those particular reflective areas that um, that thought can't enter. But um, hmm, this is this is a very very difficult subject to to explain. Uh, to maybe who somebody somebody who hasn't really entered this area is that um, is it is it stillness is is inherently within us at a, every single moment. So if you if you stop your thoughts and you go into your breath, um, you you become completely still, and then and then you're confronted with whatever's arising inside of you, what what's been packed into you made by other people, or what you've packed in uh, via your own experience in terms of your own sensitivities. Um, you know this is this is a. A very very important field to understand in terms of people are meant to support us on our journey into into emptiness into into releasing ourselves so so cooperative um compassion among people is very very important in terms of the collective um perception of a community you know so you know when there's a if you go to asia they, they've got the monks they they review the monks because they're doing they're doing a certain job so they're supported in doing that job where in the Western world we don't really support people being still or progressively moving moving their consciousness uh, to another area of perception uh, to to solicit a um, a growth of of the community. Um, you know, did you understand what I'm saying or not? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. When we are analyzing whether or not we've gotten a true realization, um, and we're trying to not do what we used to do, um, we need to be able to differentiate. You speak about the difference between uh, feelings and emotions. Can you talk about that, please? Yeah, well, your feelings, your feelings are basically, they're, they're uninhibited um, uh, receptor types inside of you, your feelings. But if you have emotions, uh, they're, they're sort of projected outwardly and you write on those projections of, of emotion. So the, 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 uh, the thief is the mind and the go.
and that's, that's the best way to communicate it. Frozen? You yes, did freeze you for are. A second, you, you, we, we, you froze right after the thief, and then you froze. <laughs> okay. Well, we've got the, the, the thief and the ghost. The thief is the mind, the process of the expectation. The ghost uh, follows that expectation in terms of the emotion projected. Now, feeling is different. It doesn't project itself, it just it, uh, it receives constantly, so it's just a feeling. And it has no reactivity to it, so you train just to have that feeling without the reactivity on those particular lines. So the, once you void yourself of your mind process, then you, you, have a, you have then the job of emptying yourself of all your emotions. And then they become pure feeling. Those pure feelings can, can interpret the um, the environment in terms of what the influx of of something which is which is more is generating more of a field of interference field than than the feeling itself. So that interference field can be spoken and write, written upon in terms of what's being revealed in the frequency of that inter interference field. So then, so that that's a progressive thing that we do with each other to release ourselves from from something which is which is not really pertinent or useful into something which is um, more inclusive in terms of accepting uh, the environment without the feeling on top of it so you can progress um, kind of unencumbered by, by weights and um, perceptions which, which alter you in terms of being concerned. So how would I apply it if I say I feel wounded or I am hurt? How do I separate that from the feeling and emotion? Well, if you feel that you're hurt, then then you you bring that hurt feeling to the surface and give it as kindness to the person that um, that you're speaking to. Instead of dumping instead of dumping it on them, you use the transform transformational effect of communication with someone that you care for. So then, so then that that gets transformed. Uh, and I, this is a very very big discipline. It's not an easy thing to do. But but what is easy? Is it easy to be in a state of anger and, and uh, resentment? Every, like you, this can go on for a lifetime. And also uh, navigating a, a, f a feeling which has come in, or an emotion which has come inside of you, which has damaged you, you give it as love to other people. And then you use you propagate good feelings. And nobody, nobody can really escape. Just say, um, uh, the Dalai Lama's kicked out of um, Tibet. He's going to be devastated. And he, he acknowledged he was devastated. He felt disenfranchised and he felt wounded. He felt like calling up and giving up, but he didn't give up. He kept giving his love, his devotion, his, um, his feelings of openness to the people who loved him. That's the only vehicle of, of communication in terms of compassion. Even though he's, he's been exiled, he, he hasn't been removed from himself. So then that greatest balm becomes our ability to nurture another or have compassion. And in that, we'll find our own healing. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah. this this has to be communally built. It's not something that can be, you know, if I say, well, I'm isolated like this, I've been isolated like this, and then I'm gathering a community that understands these principles, then, you, then you've got a collective supportive element. And this 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 has a, um, a very, very big frequency, which, which can change uh, the environment to to ten thousand miles around, uh, you know, five thousand people. You just need enough people to be on on a level of perception to change the and alter the environment. So then we talk about that collective field, and that's where you mentioned um, that quantum physics was reflecting some of the common shamanic wisdom of the observer affecting its own field. So can you yeah. talk, speak on that? Well, you. You affect your field. You, you, if you put a um, something something into your field in terms of an expectation that that is unwholesome, it's it's going to return back somehow in the wrong way. You know, so it's a so the, the your level of perception has to be consistent. Is if you don't if you don't succeed, try try again. But if you don't succeed and you try try again in the wrong way, then it has a it has an enormous effect on the on the environment because you've got to realize what you. The obstacles are meant to stop you or the obstacles are meant to try to stop you. So in the in the field of trying to bring up people's perception to be more loving, um, we can't stop. But if you do something that is stopping you, you've got to realize you've got to stop. But but we're not listening to these these very subtle messages from our environment. Did I make sense there? <laughs> yes. Um 
one of the other things that you spoke about when you talked about the observer, um, that field of um, matter, how our expectations control the field and change and shape the field, but that the motive, our motive and any expectation taints reality. And again, I just wanted to point out that this is kind of counter okay. to law of attraction. It's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of intuitive. Just say, just say that, um, okay. Now I, I know exactly where you're coming from in terms of if I am fulfilling your needs and not my needs, it's a totally different affair. So if we, as a collective, I, I notice you need, then I, I pour myself into your needs to relieve you of your pressure. Somebody will come along and do that for me. But, but we've got an opposite field of perception going on at the moment. I've written about this in, in Who Am I? in terms of if we, if we, if we want to evolve, we've got to look after our, our, our um, fellow human beings in such a loving way and they'll, they'll look after us. But we've been isolated with the, with the, if I help them, my resources are gone, what am I going to do? So it's, a, it's the opposite perception to what, to what we expect. And we've got to grow into this, otherwise we won't evolve as a, as a collective humanity if we don't realize this. You know what happens if what happens if, uh, if we have a hurricane and everything gets destroyed? What happens? Everyone helps each other. True. They've got this got an overwhelming feeling. They've lost something. You've lost something. They all come together. Yeah. But if one household gets destroyed, you've got ten households around you. None of them come to help. Yeah, that is it's, strange. It's your it's, it is your problem. Hmm. But it, when when it happens to everybody, it becomes everybody's responsibility. And the big lesson of a hurricane is this. It may be devastating, but it's showing us that we need to love and, and care for for our general community as if that hurricane didn't even occur. Yes. And it is it is a shame that it takes disaster to bring us together. But yeah. during those disasters, we do. We see some of the most selflessness and we yeah. just translate to everyday life. Yeah. Um, and, and that's what we need to ride on that momentum. I know this sounds utopian, but I don't no, well, it does, and we, we can be, continue to hold that space, and maybe we can change the field and bring that about. <laughs> we've got to. We've, we've got to actually, okay. because because <laughs> how how we how, when I look at it, I mean, tens of millions of people are in poverty. What are we doing? Yeah. What are we doing? We're 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 allowing something to to drop into a field of of. Um, suffering what are we doing what are we doing we're just letting it happen we're becoming attuned to that and and all of the advertisement all the everything goes to these poor people i mean how's that happened it's getting us used to not caring for people who need to be cared for it's yeah. a very very slippery slope what what's happening in our world at the moment and it's easy to see it on the news and becomes desensitized by it because we see it so often yeah yeah now there's a, there's another concept that we touched on in another video, but I wanted you to please explain what you mean when you say that prayer is never prayed. Your prayer can't be prayed. There's something that's no. happening in us. Can you please? Yeah, I could say I wish, I wish, I wish, um, or I could be kind to someone, or I could be open to someone. I could talk about what I'm seeing about someone. That's a prayer. That's that's not prayed. It's it's actually enacted upon. It you, it is your feeling. Your prayer is is actually what's in front of you, what you, how you need to uh, conduct yourself within the within the within the, your environment as a prayer. But if you if you um, please give me or please change, you're actually given the command that it's that you're not there. You haven't you haven't succeeded. So so then you just love your environment um, unconditionally, even if someone's being terrible. You've got to believe it. And if it, it gets to a certain point, then you just leave it. But um, we've got to try, try, try again to, to manifest the, the truth of what we believe should, should uh, be manifesting. If it's not manifesting, it means the collective attention hasn't reached a threshold of, of um, ultimate change because there's not enough, not enough of us um, being this way. And that, that's all it comes down to is there's not enough. So our prayers need to be our living actions not yes. spoken okay yeah. that makes more sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. okay i'd like to go to the chapter now when you talk about what we're supposed to do when we are under some sort of attack and we need to speak our truth you call it the gun has only one bullet which i yeah. like that would you elaborate yeah, you, 
you speak your truth. Once you speak your truth, it can't be spoken twice. Otherwise, it becomes, it becomes, um, you know, a controlling, a controlling issue. Is that you? You speak your truth on the on the moment that it needs to be spoken, and then it's delivered. You can't, you can't keep shooting that same bullet because it loses its power. Yeah. If you've yeah, got to continually you. fight for for the right for people to realize something, then you then you're just. Um, doing something over and over and over again, but you just t say your truth once back off and, and watch it very, very carefully. Yeah, until you reload. <laughs> now, when do we use that gun? You talked about um, that there's a time to reveal the truth and sometimes you just leave it alone and don't say anything. How does one determine this is a time I need to fire a bullet versus this is a time I just need to disconnect from this person and not do yep. that? Yeah, because you may be weaponizing them by 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 continually giving them a reference point. Right. So you so you you allow them to change on their own accord instead of trying to force them to change. But you will say, well, this is what's going on. Um, are you capable of seeing seeing the ramifications of your actions, or if not, you just stand back and look, and then they shun themselves from the circumstance. You know, in, the, in a lot of communities, they say, you've done something wrong. We shun you. You're out. Mm -hmm. But when when somebody does something, they actually shun themselves. in In a modern in a modern community, they shun themselves, but they don't, they don't realize they're shunned. So they collect they collect a lot of people to support their. Sh they've shunned themselves from the from the natural environment, from being being integral, and then they ask other people to support them in this illusion. And that's that's virtually witchcraft. That manipulation of oneself is witchcraft. We need to remember that yeah. one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you talk about basically the prompting of when we speak that truth, when we fire that bullet, comes from one's own self-righteousness and uh, an well, capacity, desire to protect yeah. yourself. Yeah, because you've you've got an immune system. If you if you if you wield a sword, you wield a sword to protect yourself from being cut from another sword. Action is exactly the same as this. That a, a sword can be can be someone's word, someone's feeling projected towards you and cut you very deeply. So there, there are occasions where you have to block that and say exactly your truth. Yeah. So is it true that there's only one truth or one right action in each moment that we need to hone in on? Well, yes, of, of course you you identify it and then you then you speak your truth or you act your truth or you or you don't speak anything and you see what needs to be done. You've already engaged. So it's um it's a it's a very like a it's the, the same saying it's a very slippery slope this this particular principle in terms of overdoing it or underdoing it so if i'm in an environment where i can't really say something i will watch someone very very carefully for years and they they don't they don't know they're being watched um and it's not judging them it's just they've shunned themselves from the truth of who i really am you know you understand shunning themselves um, in the in the in a, in a way which they can't really see you, they've done the shunning. You have you don't need to further inflame the shunning because they're already out of the field of your perception. Right. But the but but what's wrong with that is that is that a righteous community has become an unrighteous community, and then that shunning is is then a collective uh, mechanism of, of somebody saying, you know, let's all focus negatively this way, and uh, then this these people shun themselves from the reality of their own heart process. And then they isolate themselves from the ability to receive the truth. Yeah, but they, they don't okay. believe they're isolated because they've got a group consciousness behind them supporting the, their um, their um their unwholesome behavior because of justification. It's reinforcing their self-importance. Okay. Yeah. So then yeah. you said that, that there's a choice. So that's if we feel the need to respond um, out of self-protection or fire that bullet. But the other alternative is simply to retreat, you said, and bleed. <laughs> yeah, you, re you retreat, you're hurt, you, you take... Um, uh, counsel with your own heart and if you if you've got a loved one you give love to that person if it's so overwhelming that maybe you have to say something or you just have to cry it out it's um to 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 relieve the pressure inside of your body and um you know we're, we're in, a, in a world environment at the moment where we have to be very very careful in terms of how we're proceeding because it's a it's a very weaponized environment and uh, you don't realize it's weaponized until you're put in the position of being vulnerable financially or or circumstantial um, situations make you feel vulnerable. You know, it's um, it's a tough world, and I don't want a tough world. I want a, I want a beautiful world. Yes. <laughs> and I, I believe everybody wants this too. 
people are so conditioned and caught up in the loops of every day that I don't think most people think that's out of our reach, you know? Yeah. Um, this is a little aside. Um, in the yeah. book, in, in, in another book you said as well, that if you're engaged with someone, uh, sometimes you want to either detach from them, that you have a downward gaze, look down. What did that affect in the brain processing? Does, does that stop information from coming in or is that your time to weigh? Mm -hmm. If I'm if I'm looking at communicating with you, and then uh, if I look down inside of myself to become humble, I, I oh. any any form of reactivity is then the, you look back inside of your own humble perspective instead of looking towards it because the eyes are very violent in some ways. You know, you get someone who looks at you. Um, there are there are life frequencies. There are information coming from the eyes. So you send your eyes inwardly to your to your own countenance, to your own ability to. Uh, to realize, okay, I, I can't become the reflection of this particular person. I, I set my eyes back in, I set my ears back in, I set my feelings back in uh, to who I really am in comparison to, to what's going on in the external environment. So we don't hurt that person. I like yeah. that. So the downward gaze is kind of an internal reset, return to center, recognize yeah. your humility and reset. I like that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So now let's go to the chapter on seeking validation and self-importance. Um, you said once the internal wisdom arise, arrives, we need to release the matter. Obviously, it's no longer our business instead of seeking validation. How? Because I know that I, you know, used to pat myself on the back quite frequently for things that I thought, you know, for wisdom made or I see something in someone else and I'm proud of my recognizing their mess instead of my own. <laughs> Can you speak a little bit more about why we don't want to seek validation? what that does when we do. Because it, it builds a perpetuation of, um, of being so, so sure that, um, that you lock that person into a, into a perception or a cage that belongs to your, to, to belongs to your realizations. So it's, um, so it's, it's once, once we see something, then we, we try to let it go because, uh, because the field, the field of your realization, you can capture yourself like this and say, well, I'm right. And maybe you're wrong. And even if you are right, then then maybe you're wrong. Because because to give that person a second a second chance, a second um, a second wave of them being anything other than than who they were in comparison to who they are, you've got to give that person the opportunity. And I've done this uh, quite often with with somebody that I'm I'm engaged with at the moment. I'm always giving the opportunity to be different, and I see them incrementally uh, revert back to their their uh, destructive mechanisms, their focus and everything like that. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just uh, part and parcel of living. So you, you've, got to, you've got to try to allow that person to change. So, Did I answer the question? <laughs> yes, but I was going to, I was going to further ask you um, to talk about how our passing judgment on another limits their ability to realize their true self. Because if you, if you give them um, an emotional conflict or you do something you lock yourself into the perspective of what you, what you want in terms of your own perception you've actually locked yourself into into a state of warfare instead of letting it go so you're in a state of conflict so so it's uh, it's better to to um, be kind and be open and then realize that uh, this can't be changed and just and just free yourself to, to such a degree that you you may you may not be able to change that person, but you can be as kind as possible because the test is for you. You know, oh, it's a, yeah, the test is for you mainly. You you said that the wound that is meant to be our own seeing cannot be transferred to another. Is that what you were referring to? Yeah, the wound of your own your own seeing uh, shouldn't really be transferred to another, so that you can you can really process it purely, but. Um, you know, it's like, how often do you do you walk into a circumstance where I will realize something and the person will realize something, and then we know that we're realizing something without speaking it. You know, so it doesn't need to be spoken, but but because of repetitious neighbor nature neighbor <laughs> repetitious <laughs> uh, nature of of our conditioning is to is to verbalize and to solidify and to justify and to and to give credence to what we're seeing instead of realizing that somebody's seeing it and we note it. And just leave it alone after that particular point because once it goes into the field of conversation um this intuitive part of ourself disappears through self-congratulatory 
tones. So since you say don't talk to yourself about anything um, or others, um, how are we having healthy relationships if we can't share our insights with, uh, with someone? Okay, you, you didn't see what I said. Is it, is it if we're in a particular field of perception and you don't practice the, the, um, the, the normal weaponized type of communication, talk to each other about it, if somebody realizes, as you realize, which, uh, which is very rarely done these days, very rarely done. I realize something, you realize something. We don't need to speak about it because it's been realized. So then you, so then you, you let it float back inside of yourself, the realization. And there's there's a there's a field of perception which is which is highly intangible in, in comparison to communicating uh, what you've seen, what you've gone through, in terms of um, building a narrative around that instead of uh, an influx of information which which is altered time just a little bit between the two people, but the realization is the same. So so why do you need to speak about something you've realized if you've already realized it? between the two of you. And that's that's a communal, that's a communal affair in terms of I realize, they realize, then not interfering with it by bringing it into an into a into a, a lower level of perception instead of instead of becoming heightened, heightenedly becoming attuned on a very, very high level of, of, of reception between between each other. You know, it's like um, I mean, if you see a bird uh, singing a tree, both people look, both people enjoy, and then we go back to what we're doing. Okay, that's a shared realization. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's a so the, there's a there's a something communal which we're ignoring, which is which is highly advanced, which is right in front of us, which we which we touch upon very very lightly instead of um, realizing. Okay. Um, if I hear the wind chimes outside, surely somebody else is hearing the wind chimes. Whether or not they noticed them might be another story, but they did hear it. Exactly. Whether they notice it, whether they notice that there's a communal hearing of that, or whether it's just um, it's just in the background without really being noticed, you just you just hit something very very subtle. Okay. Okay. Now that yeah. makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, in one paragraph, you spoke about bardo and purgatory in the same paragraph, saying that purgatory was that place between doing and not doing. Are we once again between step number three and step number four? Well, if you if you realize something and let it go, if you don't realize something and don't let it go, obviously there's purgatory in between the the states of not doing. So, so that when you realize something and you torture the other person inside of you, feeling in your mind, uh, those doing, those doings need to be let go because they can't go into a not doing because the 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 purgatory is basically being captured by the perception, which uh, which has ill will, bad feelings within it. That's purgatory. Purgatory is is uncomfortable. Yeah, but realizing uh, something. Um, that that uh, that is very very refined in terms of what you're seeing is is of a lighter frequency. But we go into the into the deeper deeper darker frequencies uh, because we're used to that. So to go into a, into a self-reflective mode of seeing something, realizing it, and then and then letting it go to al to allow um, collectively everybody else to do this uh, this this exchange of consciousness instead of um, instead of willfully. Um, and dogmatically holding on to the experience of of dismay instead of love and devotion and care. So you said don't don't uh, give those opinions. Once we get that that realization and we release that, um, that the restraint we used will bring joy and enthusiasm because yeah, we well that, that's it. yeah that's our discipline. That's our discipline. So it's a, it's um it's it's a uh, it's a very very beautiful thing. To, to actually experience experience something and and still have a, a, a full container of, of affection and love for the environment because we all know that we're missing this yeah, so, cat's going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when you when you spoke about um, or when we were asking so we're trying to decide is this a time to act is this a time to speak or is this a time to retreat and bleed um, that the inner pressure, should provide an impetus to act when we're supposed to act that we should feel that by yeah that's, yeah that's the practice ground of every every individual to discover what they need to do 
and um, and don't and don't um, go against your your own nature. If you go against your own nature, there's always conflict. But if you stay with your nature, there may be a, there may be forms of conflict inside of you, and this is this is where our communal um, effect, uh, conductivity has has been uh, broken broken into separate households. You know, it's, we're not together anymore. We're not we're not communally there anymore for each other. We've been separated in a very strange way. We've got to get back to that. Yes. That would be nice without a disaster <laughs> without a disaster yeah so when you spoke about um you know when we're when we're in our very epiphany and of seeing that that's like a flower that appears and we've used that reference over and over again but you said the fragrance is the knowing and i thought that was a nice uh nuance the fragrance is you see the you see the flower but the but the the higher frequency of the flower is the frequency that it's releasing. Okay, and that's something that and, you've got to and pay you got to, to your miss. Yeah, you got to get got to get up close and personal to realize that it's actually giving you something other than what you see. Now we talked about in the quantum field how we use or recognize or are being reflected with dark matter. Can you comment on that? Okay. There's a, there's, a, there's a universal drum, and this universal drum comes from, I've seen this a dozen times in, um, in variant circumstances. And this, this, this drum, uh, you, you slowly move towards it and it bounces back to you, slowly move towards it, bounces back to you until you become empty enough to go through that drum itself. So the, so the lesson of the, of the drum or the encroaching uh, element of internal silence is to, is to you're bouncing back to yourself until you disappear completely so you go beyond the the film of that particular drum you go behind the drum and you become uh, the essence of something which can't be seen so you become uh, totally there there are two two very very dominant uh, universal forces one that can't be identified and everything that can be identified this one I, I, I have a particular quote that you said when you talked about us we are expanding exponentially from the source you said, in the beginning, there was an infinitesimal expansion of light that laid before itself an interdimensional, interspersed carpet of endless realities. This interdispersed, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So is that <laughs> carpet, is that dark matter, that carpet? Well, that's a, no, no, the, the carpet is what comes from, from emptiness uh, to, to a creative force or, or, the, or the holographic image that, uh, that, is, that pertains to the vibration, which, which, is, which is different to the silence itself. It becomes, if it's like yin and yang, it's like uh, emptiness and fullness. Is it, is it, um, is it once the emptiness becomes, a, becomes aware of something, the emptiness uh, doesn't disappear, doesn't become infiltrated, but something reflects from the emptiness in terms of the vibration that's hit it. So this this is very difficult um, to to understand is that yes. is that your your original nature comes from from absolutely nothing. That's yeah. just where you said we are everywhere, but we're inconceivably realized. Yeah, inconceivably realized from many many different perspectives. If I if I ex if I change my feeling, and I all of a sudden come onto a new come upon a new perception. That perception may be may be held and and revered by um, somebody else in a galaxy hundreds of millions of light years away. They'll turn around and look. So we draw upon ourselves the perception uh, that we would become via via the external environment uh, encroaching upon our field of perception because we we've we laid seed to 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 grow in a different way. And that different way is to go is to actually enter back into the source of our reality, which is nothing. So just mm -hmm. just to remind everybody that we're still working through the eight gates of dreaming awake, and we're still in that first gate. <laughs> so, but the last topic for today's thing it has to do with you talking about um, consciousness decoding and how we will soon be able to transport individuals from one time continuum to another and how teleportation is interdimensional and not linear. Will you elaborate mm -hmm. on that? Well, that, that's happened to me in my life, but um, but there are technologies with, which are held, which will come uh, forward in the future for sure. So so no matter what we can do, uh, just, just um, 
You look at a telephone, you ring somebody, why, why do we need the, the implement of a telephone to, to communicate with someone across the planet? This is something we, we're, our inherent nature has been put into, into items uh, that, that, uh, that become technology, which is, which is just a reflection of exactly what we're meant to grow into. So we're, as we grow into technology, what we're doing is growing into our possibilities. And as soon as we get to a certain point, those technologies will, will become um, totally symbiotically um, uh, joined with us until we realize that, uh, that where we're growing is 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 exactly where we're really meant to be in terms of how we're we're going incrementally through through certain periods of, of history and then we discover that technology is, is only revealing who we are until we get to the point that the technology and and um, and consciousness uh, become become one element one both conscious self-conscious I mean the items are self-conscious yeah, but we have to realize that the items are self-conscious. Um, look, if I look at the chair, is the chair conscious? Mm, it's conscious because it's there, because I'm aware of it. It has a vibratory essence. But um, but when you go beyond the chair itself, what's what's in the chair? Nothing. Nothing upholds that chair. So so as the technology improves, as we go into into the next uh, era of um, of being subject to AI, then maybe this might be a godsend actually to to actually reveal that we can speed up and get to the end result and um, very, very quickly get away from where we are to where we're really meant to be. Did I answer the question again? I don't yeah, know. that's pretty good. We've got to get away from where we are to who we used to be, to who we are supposed to be. That was something you said during one of our videos on the last book was making sure that we focus on what it is we want to become and who it is we want to become. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when, when you look at the manifestation of AI at the moment, it's actually, it uh, makes these beautiful pictures, and it's really, really quite profound. And as it grows, uh, we've got to we've got to piggyback on 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 our own personal growth in comparison to that. So it's uh, no matter what we've no matter what's happening, we've done it, and we've got the end result has has not really become uh, quite apparent yet. But uh, it's part of our evolutionary process. It has to be because it's happening. True. So it's definitely meant to be. <laughs> yeah. So. That was all I prepared for this segment. We finish up this book um, in our next video, but just okay. to remind everyone that we're still in that first gate, you know, yeah. and that, you know, the focus is on reversing your eyes, your ears, and anchoring yourself in that inner silence. Is there anything yes. you want to send them away with so that we know before we continue? Well, if you sit down and just, just observe your body without thought, you're already in, in a place of perception. But if you alter the perception of the feeling of yourself, then then you're away from the from the skin, from from the reality of entering your body. Because if you enter your body with an expectation, the expectation you you can't really fathom uh, what you're perceiving. So you the unexpected is very very important to come upon. Expectations kill the unexpected because it places limitations. Yes, and even if you think those limit those limitations are limited, they are limited. It's like, um, I think we spoke about lucid dreaming and, uh, and because we spoke about lucid dreaming, I went into, into, a, into a lucid framework to, to really get a concrete value of why not to do this. Because when I went into lucid dreaming, I realized inside the lucid dream, there was a bubble. When I, when I said, okay, I'm in here, I've got to give a good reasoning why not to do this and I released. So then I became aware from, from a lucid perspective, watching the, the framework of that reality. And as soon as I looked at it from the outside, it dissolved. And then from the inside, um, does exactly the same thing. So lucid dreaming is a, is a very refined illusion. And that's the only reason the Tibetans follow uh, the, the, this, this, this particular type of awareness is to realize that the illusionary capacity of awareness locks you away from the reality of what you're really looking at. And what you're really looking at is the re reality of your expectation. As soon as, as soon as you move away from the, from the loose, looser framework and you get out of it, I saw a ball. And contained within that ball was me inside of that inside of that looking at the parameters of of the inside interior of that as soon as i looked at it from the outside it disappeared it melted and then these two two awarenesses uh, discovered each other and then the the projection of the lucid dream is an illusion and the and to discover this illusion is to is to free yourself from the 
the, the expectation of any any perception because the perception holds you in a bubble and that bubble you're inside the bubble looking at looking at everything being reflected back to you so i had to get out of that bubble get out and outside the bubble to look at the exterior and as i did that the illusion disappeared so it's a very very clear framework that the the reason you're instructed to lucid dream is to is to is to deconstruct your illusions of what you expect because what you expect traps you even if you don't expect anything it still traps you and if you can get outside and look at it the whole framework of that that particular bubble melted like wax and whoa like this so oh. that's our projection and if we shine a light on our projection we'll see it's just smoke and mirrors um, from the yes, yeah, smoke and mirrors from the perspective and be able to escape that illusion to being outside of it. And as you're outside of it, the inside, the outside melts, and then the inside and the outside realize, oh, I was just subject to the most massive illusion that I've ever been subject to. Yes. So to give a real framework of why I say don't dream, to to not go down this path. But if if you're given the instruction to go down this path, it's only to break your illusions of your expectations and what you what you think you can gain from from that. And it all comes down to the empty perspective that actually sees from the empty perspective sees from from two alternative uh, points. So if I could escape the inside of that bubble and go outside, then the inside is still captured until the outside melts and realizes that that the inside was captured and the outside is revealing that. That the, that the the illusion was dissolved, boom. And then and the illusion everything. has no more purpose in our lives. It has no more purpose, no. Okay. But the the purpose of building an illusion is something we need to deconstruct. And if we if we apply this to life, then we can deconstruct everything that uh, that, that really has to be uh, looked at with a very very fine tune awareness, so we can dissolve it and become who we're really meant to be, which is which is universally um, in harmonized on many, many different levels of attention, perception. Yeah, so there you go, I'm terrible. No, that's okay, because I know that we were wrapping up, but I felt another question come up that kind of piggybacks on our last one. Um, but in terms of, can you discuss why uh, being kind of multidimensional in our teleportation, why that would help us in our evolution? Why something like that would benefit us? Well, that, that's happened to me. Well, maybe we, if we go back to the artist talking parallel perception, I'll split in three, right. split in three three positions. You would say, well, what's the advantage of that? Is because each perception has its own value, which breaks the the original content of what's what's occurred. So, so I, I'm in I'm here as a child. I'm in a space of emptiness, and I travel with a with this other being who's educating me about the universal ebbs and flow. But from three different positions, I can't capture because one position can't gain dominance because the split is in three. So, this is, and this is exactly what I just explained with lucid dreaming. That was given to me by by the old night called Luhan or the Laban, Laban, which is the name of my system, Laban Pai, elegantly flourishing spirals. It, it just means that uh, that uh, that you're not caught in um, in a process of of defining something. You you've got the opportunity to split them into different perceptions and dissolve what's happening in comparison to the other to the other anchor points so so that's that's made me a very difficult human being because uh, because because once you capture me here I, I change to here and to there so so the lucidity is not to be caught by the illusion but to realize the illusion has has to have the lucidity of, of love kindness and uh, compassion uh, combined within it so we can we can travel away from from a held fixed perception I like that from one fixed level of perception. So each anchor point or each part of conception is developing somewhat independently for the integration of the whole self. Is that, am I close? Yes, it's kind of like that. It's kind of like that. If, if you've got a different vantage point, just say that uh, I went, uh, I traveled transdimensionally. As I trans travel transdimensionally, the memory that, uh, that can occur from, from me coming back from a transdimensional uh, uh, encounter, then maybe I won't remember everything within that transdimensional encounter. I'll only remember re arriving back because because the the state of awareness that goes into that transdimensional consciousness is not um, in accord with a, with human perception. So then you so so because you're wiped, you've got to retrieve how was I wiped and how can I get back to that. So is this integration something that occurs nightly? Or is it something that like you didn't realize until you were 
in your 30s or something that the split had occurred? When do we get the benefit of the integration of these different points of perception? Well, that's like saying, can you remember all your lifetimes? Right. First, in the first instance, you'll get, you'll get a half a dozen lifetimes. And those half a dozen lifetimes will give you an indication that we're fragmented and nothing's quite, quite as stable as what you, what you believe. And if you can handle that instability, then you can, you can, you can move people's perception because you can handle that instability, or that those perceptual eddies which you, which you're uh, identifying. You're here, but you were there. You were there, but you were here. Um, you've got a lifetime here, you've got a lifetime there, you've got a lifetime in the future. If you can handle that stability, then, then there's a there's a poss possibility of realizing something beyond the solidification of our consciousness within one lifetime. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm going to ask a semi-rhetorical question. So does that mean in order to integrate these, we need to have more silence? Because you said we'll integrate it based on, you know, our ability to handle instability. So does that bring us right back to emptiness and silence? Yeah, because you, you've got to handle your instability, your 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 epiphanies in the same fashion that you, you handle an individual. You, you may have to handle maybe 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 di different individuals. Um, that's hard. Yeah. Imagine handling lifetimes. Yeah, that's true. So if you if you can handle the individuals, then you can handle lifetimes. So you've got to learn to handle the individuals that give you uh, an altered perspective upon your perception. And if you can handle that, then you can handle the alter, pers alternate perspectives of, of uh, lifetimes held and feelings from those particular lifetimes. But you only get good uh, feelings from those lifetimes. You can't, you can't bring the suffering because you can't handle it because there's there's too much going on here so the so the only way that you can really progress into the into um into this lifetime and, and handle the the diversity of of individual influxes into your life is to have compassion and to be um uh, is to understand you don't have that much control but um and to to overcome the dilemma of of bad feelings because because you're being you're being challenged to have more than just your bad feelings because you can't um alter you can't go into an alternate lifetime and expect to go there joyously and with compassion if you've got something that's blocking you because of the bad experience so if you practice this in life then maybe you've got to if you practice okay that's a is I'm being altered, but can I travel past that and see what I'm really meant to see? It's like the same with previous lifetimes. You may suffer a lot, but you will only be contained by the joy and by the happiness and by the and by the, the humbleness of those those particular circumstances. This is this is the only worthwhile thing to remember. Everything else, um, you've got so much suffering in this lifetime. You you can't be burdened by by what what's occurred. You can only be burdened by the fact that you know that there's something something more beautiful than what we're experiencing because what we're experiencing is only the memory of what's worthwhile remembering which is a good thing not the bad things so like that's that. that's why so that's why i'm saying to everybody um be challenged and and see the obstacle for what it really is because you're doing exactly the, you'll be doing exactly the same thing that i've done is that you you draw on the goodness of your life and you'll only draw on the goodness of the memories of those past lifetimes and as you said, those obstacles are missed opportunities and we just mm -hmm. hold them in love. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the best you can, your best yeah. you can, yeah. Well, great, well, that is all for today. If you have nothing okay. else, then we can kind of sign off and remind people to focus on the eyes, the ears, and anchored in silence, and we're still in the first gate. And we'll yeah. wrap it up in the next video. Yeah, all right. That's it. Thank okay. you. Okay. Love Lots you of love. Okay, <laughs> bye. bye everybody. <laughs>